Fantasy in Story. Um, how many of you know the epic moment in that clip? Some of you may know it, some of you may not know it. Uh, most everybody knows what the Peanuts characters are super popular for. Charlie Brown's always just kind of the befuddled hero. He's always getting into stuff. Lucy's the loudmouth friend. Um, you know, come on, Charlie Brown. Uh, Pigpen, how many of you got a friend like Pigpen? How many of you are the friend like Pigpen? <laughs> Uh, but Linus is always the one with the insecurity. He's super talented, super gifted, but there's an insecurity there. That's why he carries that blanket around with him all the time. All the time. He has the blanket, and typically if he's not speaking, his hand goes to his mouth. Okay? Play the clip again, Dom. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? It's the only time... Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. ...of... The peanuts that we see Linus do something very specific. And there were the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you happened? tidings of great joy. It shall be to all people. For hands. unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It. And this shall be a sign unto you. So, the story, the gospel of Christ, told by a cartoon character who wrestles with insecurity, the moment he gets to fear not, he drops his blanket and begins to proclaim in boldness this gospel. Which, just so all of you know, is a beautiful picture of what Paul talks about to us about being bold in the New Testament with our, our faith and telling this commission from Jesus to go and tell the world, uh, I'll equip you, I'll prepare you for Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you so that you can be witnesses. And Charles Schultz just did a great job telling that story that when you trust in the power of the gospel, the story, then the insecurities, the doubts on if it's you or if it's somebody else can be dropped. Because the gospel is that powerful, working not only in you, but through you. So again, I don't know if not everybody catches that, not everybody sees it. And in fact, most people don't think about it. They just go, man, that's a great speech from Linus, but they don't, real, they don't catch the, just the subtle nuance of the character and going, he set down the thing that made him most secure for the thing that really made him safe in Jesus Christ. So that was all extra. That's not in the sermon today. So how many had an awesome Christmas? Amen. Amen. It was weird, wasn't it? 76 degrees in my house. No, listen, I'm from Michigan. This is not right. We had our doors open. All day long, front door, back door, so the breeze would... Nobody wants a breeze on Christmas. Now, I'm, I'm okay with not a white Christmas. That's why we left Michigan. I'm okay. I don't need, I don't need knee-deep snow drifts and neck-deep pile. I don't need that. But I need a little... I need it to be a little brisk. Like, you can't wear a Christmas sweater when it's 76 degrees. You just can't. So... I hope that you all had a blessed day. We had a great time. We, we had a, uh, a good time yesterday morning. Kids were up early. All my kids got to come to the house yesterday morning to be there while we opened gifts and just had a great time laughing and giggling. We got Brindley a motorized car and she killed our mailbox in the first three seconds <laughs> of driving that car. Uh, bent the front end of it all up. Kids, the older kids chased her around the yard. It was so fun to watch. Uh, but we had a great time. We want to thank all of you for just your generosity this year to Real Life Church. I'm going to tell you, uh, I think great things are coming at Real Life Church. Uh, our number one core value is we are never finished. And I don't know that I have felt as much anticipation for a time as much as I do for 22. And it's, it's been hard for me the last month to not preach the sermons that are coming uh, in 22, to not preach the vision of what's going, but we're going to, and that'll start j January 9th. That series, Change Happens Here, will start on January 9th. We got a sermon next week on the, on the 3rd, 
Uh, and again, next week is the same hours as today, 9.30 and 11 o'clock. And then on the 9th, we'll go back to our regular scheduled service times at 8.30. Nine, what are our times again? 8.30, 10 o'clock and 11.30. Um, but, uh, but just so you know, next week will be the same service times as this week, 9.30 and 11. I pray that God bless you. I pray it's a good time. How many of you ready to close out Awkward Christmas? We're going to talk about the late, the latecomers today, uh, the people that showed up substantially late, but yet they're always in our scene that we talk about them every time this year comes around, and that's the wise men, the magi. Uh, the magi were an interesting group of people. They were most likely out of the real region of Persia. Uh, they were incredibly important. They would have been considered masters of mathematics and science and and, and astronomy and, and those just just those kind of sciences they would have been considered masters of. In fact, if you were to be a king or a prince of Persia, you would have been required to take the courses to reach this level, and then you would have been chosen by the peers of the Magi to be able to take that seat. So these were these were not just you know in anybody. These were people that had a lot of knowledge, a lot of history, a lot of honor within their ranks and so they showed up now the reason they would have known about this birth this prophecy this that had happened would have been because of somebody you all most likely have heard of he spent some time in a lion's den and his name was Daniel that's when this idea of the God of Israel entered into the entered into the conversation of Persia or Babylon, which we would have seen in the Old Testament. And so there's a long history of this connection to this God of Israel and the Magi. They'd heard this story. They'd heard the history of Daniel teaching these lessons and, and this prophecy so much so that they studied the prophecy and wanted to kind of follow it out. And so they showed up. Now I'm going to go ahead and read in, in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew takes a hard shift. Matthew chapter 1 tells us all about the genealogy of Jesus and who begat who and who begat who. And told us about the two prostitutes in Jesus' bloodline, which don't get talked about very often. Talked about David. Talked about all the stuff that go, happens in his genealogy. Did we get a real quick snippet of the story? And then we jump to chapter 2 of Matthew which jumps basically two years ahead. It could be anywhere from two to three years ahead in the story. So we just skip the manger, skip the shepherd, skip the whole Bethlehem scene, and we move ahead. Now they still may be in Bethlehem at this time because the census would have been a, a pretty big journey. It was about a 70-mile journey from where Joseph and Mary were from. And so they, they probably would have stayed there just trying to maintain to get enough, making sure the trip back would have worked. And so they're still in Bethlehem, and the Magi show up. Now they get a star, which a star a lot of time is not going to give you a direct spot on earth to stop at. But that's what they had to look for and to kind of watch for. And so they came into the region, and the first thing you do when you are an honored person of position is you check with the people that are in charge. And so let's dive in. Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 2, or excuse me, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now just real quick, some story on this. This line in itself would have caused Herod to struggle. Where is he that's been born the king of the Jews? That's a big deal when you are the regent of an area and you have an emperor as a Roman official. There are no kings. There is only one Caesar. And so um, this is a problem. This is a threat. Where is he that's been born the king of the Jews? The Jews don't have a king. They have us. And so that threat is what was spoken by the wise men. They didn't intend it as a threat, but that's the way Herod took it. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is Christ to be born? And they told him, well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. Now what I'm about to read in verse 6 is an Old Testament passage. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you 
shall come a ruler who will shepherd the people of Israel. So this was pro Old Testament prophecy that they brought to the table and said, hey, hey, this is what it says about the Messiah, that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. When Herod summoned the wise men secretly and he ascertained from them about what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may too come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So we understand that this star wasn't necessarily a star. Not necessarily what you and I would recognize as a star. This was, if you remember in the Old Testament, there was a moment where the children of Israel are, are running, or they're in the wilderness, and there is a cloud of fire, or a pillar of fire by night, and a cloud of smoke by day. There's, there's this there's this obvious object that they're following that would have been the same in the star. It's just defined as a star, a bright object, because now they're here and they walk outside. The star appears again, and stars just don't appear and disappear. Stars are. And so the star appears again and goes before them to the place where he was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceed, with exceedingly great joy. And going into the What's it say, church? No manger. No donkey. No yaks. They went into the house and they saw the what, church? Not infant. Not babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Child. These words are very different in the Greek. So when you see house, you see abode. When you see stable, or you, know, you see something very different. When you see infant, you have someone who's probably between the, birth, uh, the age of birth to one year. This would have been a very small child. When you see the word child, you're talking someone who's anywhere from two to four years old. Specific words. So when they went into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Again. How many times does Mary get to have a moment where she's like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> two years, I mean, we've had the baby two years, Joseph. Things have been pretty chill. We've been hanging out here. And now this random caravan of people from Persia show up, and they walk in, and they don't say anything. They see the kid, and they fall down, and they worship him. Now they understand why they would worship him, but they don't understand why they're here. There wasn't a note or an email sent beforehand. This was a knock on the door of a caravan because Magi did not, this was not three wise men trekking across the desert on their camels. Okay? I know we all have this imagery in our mind. We, we were looking at it again this week. Um, Brandon was asking me from our Gainesville location. He said, Pastor Vince, he said, the whole donkey thing in your sermon you were throwing me. I said, look at it. Read the story. Tell me anywhere other than at the end of Jesus' life that it mentions him or anybody around him riding a donkey. He said, I, I checked. It's not there. And I said, now go and look at every picture. Every picture is Mary riding a donkey. And the wise men are riding camels. I don't know why they got the camels and Mary got the donkey. I don't know why they didn't ride donkeys. I don't know. They may have. I just know that the Bible doesn't tell us. It also never tells us that there are three of them. It just says the wise men. And they would have walked in a group because each would have had a specialty. It's just like I said, they would have been masters in certain things. And so they would have each had something that they focused on. And so there would have been a group of them. And I'm just going to tell you, royalty, which is how Magi would have been seen, they don't travel by themselves. There would, have been, there would have been a group. So when they rolled up to the king's house, it was one thing. But when they rolled up into Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph's house, that was another. Knock on the door, walk in, worship Jesus. They opened their treasures and offered him gifts, gold, frankincense. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Aaron this week sent me a meme that had the wise men 
and it said this. It was like, we've brought gold, we brought frankincense, and wait, there's myrrh. So, <laughs> so now every time I read, I, every time I have read that scripture, I've thought of that that way. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me just spit it out. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This journey would have taken several years to make from Persia where they were at. Just because of the type of journey it was, the terrain that it was. It would have, it wouldn't, it's not just something they chose to do on a weekend um, to get the wise men there. Now, I'm, I want to lean into the wise men. Everybody understands now we're not sitting at the manger. We're not, there's not a fire built. There's, there may be a fire built, but it's not in the stable at Bethlehem. This is a home now that Mary and Joseph have. The wise men have walked in. The wise men come with very specific things. And again, I'm going to get to the gifts in, in a second, but I want, I want to just talk through this idea of how, how you can assess your year because I think we're coming to the end of 2021, and it seems like now the last couple of years, everybody's just kind of used to the next thing that's coming. How many of you are like not surprised anymore when you watch the news? I mean, it's, it's going to be one thing. It's, it's COVID, it's Delta, it's Omicron, and then next, I hope they come up with a better Transformer name. Um, but... <laughs> It's, I mean, it's, and I'm, I'm not making light of what it is. I'm just, because uh, I understand the seriousness of it. Don't misunderstand that. But what, I'm, what I do say is that we, we sometimes, we don't get shocked anymore. And we're becoming a culture that gets less and less shocked by things that happen in the world. There were multiple school shootings in the last month. We don't hear about them. We don't talk about them. They're kind of, they're pushed aside. Why? Because we don't get surprised by anything anymore. We just don't get surprised by anything. And it concerns me, there's a, there's a prophetic scripture that talks about um, the world. It doesn't talk about America, but it talks about the world being in a place where they would not blush. Being in a place where they would not be shocked, or they would not be embarrassed, or they would not be just taken aback by anything. And, and I feel our culture shifting that way. And so with that, I think what's important for you and I as believers is assessment, to be able to, to kind of just step back and take a hard look at ourselves and go, okay, Lord, what is it? Like, what is it that maybe if I got, if I'm going to look at my life over the last year and I'm going to look at 21 and, and what kind of things happened in 21, um, and I want to know how I, how I did. And, and don't misunderstand again. I, I don't think that there's a score sheet or anything like that. And God's not got a check box where he's went, yep, you prayed twice a day. You didn't. It's not that. But there are a couple of things that the wise men did really well that I think is important for us today. And there's only two things that I'm going to give you out of their story. And we're going to close out this awkward Christmas. And uh, I'm going to do a sermon next week called I'll Do It Tomorrow. Um, which seems fitting on the weekend. Everybody makes New Year's resolutions, right? <laughs> um, and so we're going to do that next Sunday, and then we're going to kick off this series called Change Happens Here. Before we get to Change Happens Here, I need you to assess. Because I'm just going to tell you straight out of the gate. I'm going to get in your plate next year. Because God has been wearing me out. And we're not going to simply be a church in this community. We're going to be, we're going to be one that changes it. We're, we're, we're going to be the, the city on the hill that God called us to be. And I need you to look at yourself and go, God, where do I fit in that? Where do, where do I fit in sharing with my friends and family the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where do I fit in inviting someone that I don't know? Where, where's my compassion, God? What, I need you to look inwardly. We've been taking communion once a month for the entire year. And the part of the communion that's so incredibly important is that examining yourself. This is that moment as we close out this year. Now this week, how many of you know this is like the worst week of the year? The week between Christmas and New Year's, very little gets accomplished. Because everything's a short week. And man, the first week of January, we feel like we're just catching up. And uh, I get it, I understand. But this today, I just want to maybe start the ball rolling for you thinking through, God, have I done these things? And if I haven't, Lord, how, how can I do them better in the year to come? How can I be more attentive in the year to come? The first thing is this. As we, we get into the idea of who 
these wise men were, again, just two things that I want to give you. The first, first thing that they did in as far as if I'm looking at them in this example is they were seeking the right thing. They were seeking the right thing. And I would challenge you to look at your life. And if you say, man, I, I, this last year, it got so busy. It got so crazy. I had so many things come up. Some of you have dealt with, with loss this year. Some of you have dealt with a uh, job shift and transition. Some of you have dealt with so many different things that we can very quickly get pulled out of alignment of what God would have for our life. We can very quickly get pulled out of alignment with the thing that God may be asking of us or, or actually looking into us. We may be missing the things that God is depositing in us in this moment so that we're prepared to seek him out in the next moment. Because we're just so busy and we're so wrapped up in stuff. And so the thing that the wise men did, I love the fact that they sought the right thing. We may have to travel a year or two to get there, but we're going to go see this thing. We're going to go see this Messiah, this Jesus that is so real. How do you know he's real? How did the Magi know he was real? Imagine the gamble. We struggle with faith. And these guys got on whatever animal and left their country for months, if not years, to track down something they'd only heard about in stories. They sought something that was bigger. They sought this thing that was so much bigger in their life that if it's there, then man, we have to see it. We have to go be a part of it. If it's there, I can't miss it. If it's there, then I don't want to spend my life wishing I would have went and seen it. I've got to go and see it. So they sought the right thing. And in your life, I think when we talked through Christmas this last weekend, how many of you have ever got a disappointing Christmas gift? <laughs> Not that it was yesterday. I said ever. All right? You ever got a gift and you're like, oh, man, thanks. You know, what I, you know the face you have to make? This is great. I just love it. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. The reason that we have disappointing Christmases or we receive gifts that are disappointing is because we have an expectation. We expected something different. And when we don't get up to our expectation, we run into problems. We see this happen all the time in marriages, in dating, in work, in, in relationships. I have this expectation, but I may not have told you the expectation. Therefore, you couldn't get there if you tried, but I'm going to be disappointed when you don't reach it. That's where disappointment comes from. And the only thing that changes disappointment is seeking the right thing. Seeking the right thing from God and going, God, I want to seek the right thing from you. And so we see this in Jeremiah chapter 29. A few weeks ago, I shared this verse with you. And I want to just kind of maybe give this to you. When you see, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Verse 14 says, and I will be found of you. The wise men spent their time seeking the right thing. It's written that we're going to find you. So they sought the right thing and they looked in the right place. The Bible told them where to go. I don't know what you're seeking from God. If, if all you're seeking from God is just this, man, I just can't wait to get to heaven. Me neither. But I got stuff to do tomorrow for the gospel. I, I got stuff I want. I've still got some things I need to deposit into my kids in regards to Jesus Christ and who He is. I can't wait for heaven, and we're going to all have a great time, those of us that go. I hope you go. But I'm seeking God here, in today, in tomorrow, in the day after. And I'm going to look for him in his word where he tells me that he can be found. And I'm going to look on, on how to give that away and how to share that with other people. Are you seeking, have you sought the right things this year? Is church a Sunday duty? Is it the voice of God going, I want to spend time with you. Come to the house today. Learn about me. Seek after me. Have you sought the right things in this last year? That's a hard question. That's why I don't need anybody jumping up and saying yes or no. I, I need you to ask yourself, God, 
this past year, before I go into next year, did I seek you like I should have? Oh no, Pastor Vince, nobody ever seeks you. Like, no, I'm not, I don't, I gave up Sunday school answers a long time ago. You know, where the answer to everything is Jesus. Now listen, there is a reason it says real life on the door. You all have struggles, I have struggles. There are days I am not the picture perfect Christian. Can I get an amen on that? But then there are also days I'm just lazy. And I'm not seeking God the way I ought to. My challenge is to you in the year to come, seek God. Jeremiah 29, 13 and 14. I know I told you to make 11 one of your life verses, for I know the plans that I think for you, says the Lord, and that they are good to give you hope, to give you an expected end, saith the Lord. That's a great verse. But maybe this year, maybe you, you shift down a couple verses and go, and you... You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And when you do that, I will be found by you. Let me challenge you with that. Seek a God who wants to be found by you. He wants you to find him. Second thing that we get from these wise men and the last thing. Sorry. I should have told you I'm going to be here a while. You just keep doing what you're doing. I got six minutes till the next one gets going, so we're good. They not only sought the right things, but they gave the right things. It's interesting to me that when they came to Jesus, they didn't come with an expectation. They came with an offering. Before you start thinking about, oh, we already took the offering, Pastor Vince, it's not at all what I'm talking about. Maybe a portion of it for some of you, that may be where you're at in your journey, but for the rest of you, they walked, let me get this for you, they walked through those doors or those doors out there going, what do I have to offer this king? And I'll be honest with you, seasons in my life, where I've walked through those doors or other church doors in my life and my expectation was when I walked in, what do you have for me? Boy, you better bring it today. I brought visitors with me, Pastor Vince. I hope it's a good one. And it's okay. I get it. I'm going to do my best for it to be a good one every time I speak. It's not always the case. But I've caught myself at times coming to God only for what I can get from him or what I can receive for him. And yet when the wise men traveled across the desert, across from their land, however long the journey took, their first response was, there's the king. What can we do for you? There's the Messiah. How can we be of service? This is what we've got to bring. This is what we brought with us. We hope it's enough. But here here we are. We've seen him. We've seen the hope of the world. Now that he's here, here's what we have to offer. What are you giving? What have you given this year that means something? You see, each of the gifts meant something. The gold was a sign of royalty. Not everybody had gold then. They brought gold. He's the king. They even said that to Herod. Where is this king of the Jews? And a king needs needs to be known. So gold would have been an immediate thing. Also, the gold would have been what funded Mary and Joseph to be able to make the trip to Egypt and live safely while Herod was massacring these children. How many of you know God's timing is perfect? That he established in a wise man in Persia that he needed them to come to Bethlehem with a specific gift that would get this young couple and their baby safely to a place so that another prophecy would be fulfilled that said, and my son shall come out of Egypt. Yeah, he's a perfect God. So what he's asking of you is not strange. It's perfect for what's next. Frankincense was a gift that they used in the temple. It was a, 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 a spice, that they, an aroma that they used in the temple. So the priest would have managed it. 
So they gave him a gift of royalty, but they also gave him a gift of priesthood, this, this gift that only a priest would quite understand. And as they burnt incense, as they would come into the temple, and they would fill the temple with fog so that the presence of God would be able to be revealed. No, we know who you are. We know that you're the high priest. We know that once all this comes to pass, there will be no more veil to keep us from you. There will be no more separation that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We understand you're the high priest. And they gave him frankincense. And then myrrh was the most confusing gift. You talk about awkward. Here's your baby. Here's the burial spices. You see, they didn't just stop at the prophecy of his coming. They read the rest of the story and realized that as much as there was a child to be born in the city of David, a Savior to be born, how is he going to save us? Oh, there's that part about him being crushed. There's that part in Isaiah about his beard being torn from his face to where he'd be unrecognizable. There's this part that though he may lay in the ground, he'll return again. So yes, we know he's the king. And yes, we know he's the high priest. But we also understand that he needs to be prepared for a moment that is going to change everything. I wonder in your life, church, I wonder if you've been seeking the right things. I wonder if you've been offering the right things to God in this last season. And if you haven't been, this is not a conviction sermon of you better get things right. No, this is me just challenging you going, if it hasn't been who you were, let it be who you are for the sake of the gospel. Let it be who you're going to be for the kingdom of God because there is a world out there that doesn't know what to seek and they have no idea what to bring and you are the only Bible they're reading. I go to real life church. That's awesome. I'm glad you do, but understand, when you tell them, then everything you do is a reflection of me, of the staff, of this place, Please don't put a real life sticker on your truck and then flip people off. It's happened before. To me. <laughs> it's my favorite real life memory. I got flipped off by somebody with a real life sticker in their truck. What you seek matters. What you give matters. My challenge to you today is simply this. Seek. God, did I seek you this year? I'm not asking if I spent time with you. I'm asking, God, did I seek you out this year? Did I, did I learn something more about you this year than I've known before? Did I seek you out? God, did I give to you this year. Yes, you've blessed me financially, and if that's the way you gave, great. But God, is there something of me that I can give? Is there something, is there another treasure or talent that you've given me, God, that I could be giving? My prayer for each of you, always, is that God's best would be yours. That's what I pray for people. I don't know what you need specifically, but if it's God's best, it's got to be all right. So I pray that, God, I pray that your best would be theirs. I pray that your best for their home, that your best for their marriage. God, your best for their kids. God, your best in their job. God, your best in everything that they do. But God, give them your best. But church, if God's given you his best, which he already did in Jesus, but you're being blessed beyond measure. Go seek him. And go give back.